from Boston, Massachusetts, and Rivaldo Dendo headquarters of Ali Nese with a quick case review. I'm joined today by Dr. Cornelia Grau, a dentist from Elsfeld, Germany, with a private practice limited to endodontic therapy and surgical endodontics, as well as microsurgery. Dr. Grau, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me. Of course, the pleasure is mine. And I recently ran into a very interesting case that you had done. And I wanted to share this case with our audience. And this is a case of an internal resorption of a maxillary left central incisor that you treated with a combination of techniques and so on, which I thought was very interesting. And I wanted to um, I'm just kind of share this uh, with our audience. So can you tell us a little bit about this uh, patient's age, uh, the chief complaint, how they presented to you, and what was your diagnosis? So this patient was a, a female, I think 30 year old, 31 year old woman. And she was referred from her dentist to me uh, because of this um, like complicated case with this internal resorption of the anterior uh, number nine. And um, she was not in pain when she was um, contacting me and showed me a, an x-ray her a dentist uh, made. It was a panoramic radiograph. And uh, yeah, she, she contacted us for a consultation first. So in cases where you have an internal resorption, where you obviously see an anomaly in the shape of the anatomy, uh, I mean, historically, we could tell the difference between internal and external resorption by, you know, trying to take a couple of different angle radiographs, as well as looking to see if you see the outline of the canal inside the resorption lesion or not. But now we have the benefit of CBCTs. Uh, my understanding is you also took a CBCT? Yes, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. I, I leave the, the panoramic x-ray um, alone and um, recommended to do a CBCT first before going into the case mm -hmm. and in, into the treatment. Sure. And the goal of the CBCT in these types of cases is to first find the outline of the lesion and then look out primarily on its location and to look out to see if there are any perforations, correct? Yes, that's correct. And we have the, the benefit of the axial view of the root. And we can um, look if, if the resorption is still only internal or if the root canal walls are affected too. Right. And I think it's the, that's the, one of the most important um, prognostic factors in terms of whether a tooth is salvageable or not, is whether there is a perforation from the internal resorption or not. Was this case, as you said, was, so it was a necrotic case to begin with, correct? Or was there some tissue? There was a vital tissue. Um, when I went into the case, uh, at the first uh, treatment, um, there was still vital tissue um, below the resorption. Below the resorption. So in the, apical, in the apical part of the canal. Terrific. So uh, how did you set up? And was, by the way, was there a history of trauma or orthodontic therapy in this tooth that you may have recalled from the patient questioning? I asked. Yes, I asked her about it, if there was orthodontic treatment before or if there was a, a dental trauma long before, but she didn't really remember. Yeah. She couldn't tell me exactly what, what happened like years ago. Yeah, oftentimes these internal resorptive uh, cases are idiopathic, the cause is unknown, but the treatment remains the same. You should always, as long as there's no perforation and the tooth is salvageable, we have to try to save the tooth with a conventional root canal first and then follow up. But the challenge there that could grow is the cleaning and shaping of these abnormal shapes. So can you tell us a little bit about how you went about your uh, access here? You uh, have access to the tooth, you have placed the rubber dam, and uh, of course you, there is the, the, you probably fixed the rubber dam with widgets uh, so that you cannot see yeah. a clamp. But then how did you go about removing the tissue, especially in that internal resorptive defect? So yes, I, um, to get to the working length, I use my hand instruments. And then um, the, the shaping, I was using the bi-raise files until the size 5004. Mm. And um, for a medicament, I put calcium hydroxide uh, into the canal and wait approximately one week until mm. she came back. And I, then I cleaned everything up with the, with the XP endo finisher with to the finisher. remove every, yeah. yes, with a finisher. So basically instrumented to a fairly large size, so it says 5004, 
and then calcium hydroxide treated the tooth, which is a wise idea in these types of cases where we know it's difficult to reach those areas inside the resorptive defect. And then a week later, which is usually a good amount of time for the calcium hydroxide to kind of take its effect, you came back, yeah. removed the calcium hydroxide using 3D instrumentation, and then irrigated it out. And what, what did you use primarily for irrigation? Uh, I would assume sort of my chloride, what strength do you prefer? Yeah, I use the 5% mm -hmm. uh, sodium hypochlorite and then uh, EDTA 17% and um, chlorhexidine 2% as the final as irrigation. The final and then it seems like you set out to, um, um, to obturate and we can see here now you have put an apical segment uh, of the uh, gutta percha first. Uh, was that primarily, was that hydraulic condensation, basically by ceramic and BC cones and so on? And then you seared yes, off at yes. that point? Exactly. Okay. I put the BC sealer with the, um, with the, um, um, a lentula spiral type of a thing or, yeah. or, or yeah. syringe you just injected yeah, it directly? Okay. Just inject into the apical part of the canal, mm -hmm. put in the BC cone and, um, Use the, the the heat source to the, uh, the heat sear source off to cut it off. Yes, at the coronal exactly. extent of uh, at the most apical uh, extent of the resorptive defect. Now, when I was looking yes. at the X-ray that you sent, you know, one little um, uh, trick that can be used is to use that same uh, post preparation trick that I have shared. You know, the the, the, the little uh, and I said post uh, prep technique, which is to segment the gutta percha with a sharp scalpel at that point so that you know sometimes it's difficult to get the heat down there um, mm -hmm. you can then just segment the gutta percha kind of notch it uh, put it down there and then uh, then basically uh, instead of using heat you can just kind of apically pressure put some apical pressure yeah. and twist it off and then it looks like here what you did after doing that is you ended up filling that entirely with a uh, with the RRM material is that basically the biceramic RRM? Yes, that's right. That's right. I fill the whole resorption area with the um, with um, a fluid RRM RRM yeah, the material. The syringeable material. Now so you did a great job. You didn't even uh, trap any voids in there. What was your trick? What Thank was your uh, what was which needle tip did you use? Did you use the um, the actual uh, dispensing tip that comes with it, or did you use a thinner nozzle? No, I used the dispensing tip, which comes uh, with it, exactly. Right. So the trick with that is to have good visualization, and I know you use a microscope, and the key is to get the n uh, nozzle tip to the base of the preparation, the same way you would backfill with the Optura gun, and then very slowly back up, correct? Is that what you did too? Of course, of yeah. course. And I let the, the, the needle where the RM comes out mm -hmm. in, um, in the fluid, um, yeah, not, not to, above not it. Not so to, just um, kind of, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's just the same, pretty much the same thing we do whenever we do, we used to do a backfill with the Optura gun or whenever you're filling in a tooth with a, with a core, with bulk filling a tooth with a core so that you're not, you don't trap voids. That's a really key elemental thing that you, you just mentioned. So you fill this up to the top part of the, um, of the uh, resorptive defect with the RRM yeah. syringable. And then I can see yeah. then you also put in another another plug up on top of that. What material did you use exactly. for that? Exactly. Yes, I used the BC um, fast set putty, putty. putty material yeah. exactly yeah. to have a little bit a thicker layer of a yes a, a faster setting material to put my composite. Um, right. So that's, that's and that's the trick. The reason you did that as opposed to fill all the way back up is you wanted to have a little bit of a harder substance or something to put your restorative material against, right? Yeah. Uh, and then yes. what did you do? Did you do directly or composite? Or did you put another layer? Because it looks like to me like there's an ex uh, one more layer possibly there of something, or is it direct? Yeah. The first layer was a flowable composite. Yeah. And then um, the, and then the a surface of that is a, a little yes. bit of a microfill kind of a composite so that you get better polishability. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's the key thing is to have a kind of a by a flowable. I mean, you're not we're, we're talking about some kind of a glass ionomer base, uh, resin modified glass ionomer flowable material that would then have some type of a bond with the bioceramic. Uh, and then that yeah. allows you to also it's dual cure so you can kind of uh, light cure and you get a harder su uh, surface. And then the last a couple of millimeters of the surface you've put on 
a, um, a thin layer of composite that is polishable mm -hmm. and it can get that nice uh, smooth surface that's both aesthetic and polishable. And inside the tooth, you pretty much have a monoblock uh, that is filled with the, um, um, with the bioceramic material, which is several different, and that's actually an interesting case where you're showcasing the different viscosities of the same bioceramic composition as a sealer, as an RRM, and as a putty material so that it is basically used in each specific application where its benefits are uh, kind of showcased for that specific uh, use. And, yes. um, and you know, some people might say, well, you know, by putting the filling the whole thing with the, um, with the syringable material, that would be very difficult to retreat. But I think at this point, a tooth like this, if it fails, the question is not, you're not gonna go back and retreat it, you would go straight to surgery, correct? APO yes, would be exactly. the treatment for this. Yeah. And also, frankly, even in the teeth where it's filled completely with the bioceramic in the coronal two thirds as a backfill, ultrasonics can go through that fairly easily in the straight portion of the canal because the material doesn't set like composite, it sets like desiccated yeah. ZOE. Well, yes. Dr. Grau, I think you have put a lot of uh, tender, loving care in this tooth, given the shape of the resorptive lesion looks like a big heart. So I can see that you've put a lot of uh, love into uh, uh, your work and uh, you've done a wonderful job. And uh, I know it's a weekend and, uh, and it's a little bit later over there in Germany. So um, I really appreciate you giving me the time and uh, to uh, share this case uh, and your expertise here with our audience. Thanks so much, Ali, for having me here and inviting me for the interview. That's much fun. It's been my pleasure. From Ilsford, Germany, I uh, was joined by Dr. Cornelia Grau, uh, great private practitioner and limited to endodontics over there. And from Rewold Endo uh, here in Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ali Nese, and let's save some teeth. <laughs>